Thank you. Uh, the Centre for Culture, Community and Society is based in the Faculty of Health, Education and Society, um, but it's an interdisciplinary research centre and it involves um, people in the arts, in science and technology and also in business. And within the time limits that I've got today, um, I'm just going to talk about one particular strand of research uh, within the centre, um, talk about a project that we've recently undertaken, um, which is looking at the role of the media in communicating climate change and looking at um, the increasingly important role that the media play in shaping people's attitudes towards the climate change debate and how uh, the media contribute to particular cultural predispositions uh, towards sustainability. Um, so this particular project focused on the Rio Plus 20 summit in June last year and um, looking at the way in which the media play an important role in setting the agenda. And in this study, we focused on looking at UK national newspaper coverage of, of the summit, um, recognising that the deficit model, um, this idea that all you need to do is give the public more scientific information and um, then you know, they'll, they'll understand the debate actually is very flawed and it's not just a question of giving people more information that will solve everything. Um, so we certainly recognise that there's a very complex relationship between media messages on the one hand and public perceptions and attitudes on, on the other hand. Um, looking at some of the newspaper headlines at the time of, of the summit, um, they tended to be very um, pessimistic and uh, one of kind of doom and gloom, low expectations around what could actually be achieved from the summit. Um, so, you know, you've got the Times calling it pathetic, um, Daily Mail typically, um, you know, talking about meaningless green drivel. And, of course, many of the world's leaders were absent from the summit, so it wasn't considered to be particularly newsworthy from the point of view of, of the press. Um, Obama wasn't there, for example. Cameron wasn't there. Uh, there's also the perception of climate fatigue, that public had had enough of, of hearing about these you know, summits going on all the time. Um, science and technology budgets for newspapers have been dramatically cut. Um, you know, particularly if you compare, um, you know, the number of journalists that attended in 1992 compared to 2012, and, um, you know, it wasn't considered to be very newsworthy. So, uh, Greenpeace sought to generate more news coverage, and they tied in um, their Save the Arctic campaign with the um, Rio summit, and what they did was to kind of call on um, celebrities, Hollywood actors, rock stars, um, business leaders, uh, to sign the Arctic Scroll. And this was kind of unveiled on the day of the, um, the Rio summit. And it certainly did generate, you know, a fair bit of, of media coverage. You know, it had all these, these um, images of polar bears, uh, the homeless polar bear stunt in cities around the world, including London. And um, Paul McCartney was wheeled out, as was One Direction, the boy bands who appealed to kind of younger um, audiences. Um, so what we did in this study was to look at um, the framing of the summit and to look at the level of, of coverage. And um, it was no great surprise to see that uh, The Guardian carried by far and away the most coverage of the summit. Um, it had a rolling live blog. Um, and the uh, highest circulating red top newspapers like The Sun only carried a handful of articles. And what was interesting was that those articles tended to focus on the Save the Arctic campaign. They were very much celebrity based. So The Sun was focusing on One Direction in particular um, to try and draw its readers' um, attention to what was going on. So this does raise um, you know, a number of, of issues in terms of um, how the media are framing these kind of events and the crucial thing, what impact does this actually have on public attitudes and behaviour? <coughs> 
Um, and in the US, one of the most popular models uh, looking at the, um, what kind of drives public attitudes towards climate change is this cultural cognition model, um, which is adopted by a number of scholars at um, the Yale uh, School of Law, and superficially offers quite an interesting um, account of where, people, um, where people's positions on climate change originates. And what it's trying to suggest is that um, people tend to draw on pre-existing uh, worldviews um, about how they think society should be organised. So individ individualistic and hierarchical worldviews, um, those people who adopt those kind of worldviews, according to this theory, suggest that actually... Um, climate change poses no real risk to us, whereas those people who tend to adopt a kind of egalitarian or communitarian um, position on climate change tend to be much more concerned about um, you know, what's happening. Now, I think this um, is quite a simplistic explanation of, of what's going on. And what we want to do in terms of building on this is to look at how the different framings in the newspapers, and clearly the Guardian tends to adopt a more kind of communitarian, egalitarian discourse, how they link with public attitudes. And the cultural cognition model is very much based on US politics. So I think we kind of need to have a broader approach that we're uh, developing. Um, and these are just some of the outputs that have come from this particular um, study in terms of um, what we've been doing.